As we come to the cross, it is apparent that you cannot just look at Jesus on the cross and observe him as you might look at any other object. You have to get involved. Douglas Webster, in his book, In Debt to Christ, said this, the cross cannot be observed objectively from a detached position. That is precisely why the disciples were not there. They were not ready to be involved. As we now spend our time there, it is clear in our own hearts that we are ready to engage, to be involved once again in what it cost the Lord Jesus to die on the cross for us. But even as you look at the suffering and we enter into it here, there is an expression of watching Jesus engaging in Christ dying on the cross, of entering into that in some way, which is inappropriate. Because there is a way in which we are just drawn out in pity and we mourn what has happened to him. You may remember the words out of one of the hymnals, who come and mourn with me a while, O come ye to the Savior's side. O come together, let us mourn, Jesus our Lord is crucified. Have we no tears to shed for him, while soldiers scoff and Jews deride? Ah, look how patiently he hangs. Jesus our Lord is crucified. I want to say to you up front, that is an inappropriate sentiment. We do not give this to you or gather in any morbid sense at the cross just to stimulate in ourselves pity for Jesus. Robertson, in one of his more famous sermons, F.W. Robertson, an English preacher, a printed sermon on the loneliness of Christ, said this, There is a feeble and sentimental way in which we speak of the man of sorrows. We turn to the cross and the agony and the loneliness to touch the softer feelings, to arouse compassion. You degrade that loneliness by your compassion. Compassion, compassion for him. Adore, if you will, Respect and reverence that sublime solitariness with which none other but the Father was, namely Jesus, but not pity. Let it draw out the firmer and manlier graces of your soul. So when you look at Luke chapter 23, and this first word from the cross. Verse 32 says, Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. And when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And when we observe that together and we hear those words of the Lord Jesus, I want us intelligently to respond to what is being said here. Not just to have compassion and pity. As Robertson said, that would degrade what Jesus is enduring on our behalf. But to give our minds an understanding as we view it, so we see the pain and the anguish, 
We understand the cost physically. But beyond that, Jesus is saying something much more profound. Father, forgive them. They know not what they are doing. Now, one or two things they did know. They did know Jesus was a good man. When they killed him by crucifixion on the cross, they knew they were killing a good man. They knew that the hands that they had smashed to that cross were the hands that had reached out to the bereaved and the broken and the lame and the blind and the deaf and the bereaved and the sick. Those hands had reached out and healed the hands they were crucifying to the cross. They knew, they did know that. They did know that the feet that were impaled to the cross were feet that had carried Jesus on many amazing errands of mercy. They did know that. So they knew they were up to some mischief. They were not completely innocent of what they were doing. But when Jesus said, forgive them for they know not what they do. What they did not know was that they were crucifying the God who had created the whole of the universe. They did not know that. They did not comprehend that. They did not know that their heinous sin in rejecting Jesus and crucify him would redeem the world. And that somehow in that act of theirs, unknowingly, they were participating in bringing salvation, forgiveness, and healing to this world of ours. They did not know that. They did not know that their unmerciful act was the means by which God would bring mercy to this world. They did not know that. They did not understand it. They had no comprehension. They did not know that their rejection would bring, by God's amazing grace, our reconciliation to the Father. Their rejection would bring about our reconciliation. They did not know they had no understanding that their killing Jesus would bring about the gift of eternal life. They had no understanding. They did not know what they were doing. In that regard, they had no understanding that God, in some extraordinary way, took even their sin to bring about His amazing act of mercy and forgiveness and reconciliation, the gift of eternal life. They did not understand that. In that single statement, that they were in fact crucifying the Lamb of God sacrificially, who in that act would take away the sin of the world. They had no idea. The word here in the text of Luke for forgiveness is the word aphiemi. Father, forgive them. Father, aphiemi them. That word literally means to release, to let go. In other words, do not hang on, Father, to this act of theirs. Release them from it. Let them go. Turn them loose. Do not hold them accountable. Forgive them. Release them 
from any obligation to what they are doing. Release them from any repercussion of this awful thing. Father, forgive them. Do not hold on to what it is they're doing. You see, Jesus was the beloved of the Father. The Father was looking at His only begotten and His beloved Son and watching what humanity was doing to Him. And if you were watching someone you loved suffer as Christ was suffering at the hands of wicked people, you would not let that go. You would not be able to release them. It would take a miracle for you to turn loose all the hate and vengeance that would, you would immediately store in your heart against those who committed that awful crime. Release, said Jesus. Do not hold them accountable. In effect, Jesus is saying the same thing of us here this afternoon. Father, release them. We sang last night. We will sing again today. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? You were there. In some amazing way, you were participating in that. Because Christ was dying for your sins. And the people killing Jesus represented our great rejection of God until Christ had died on the cross. We would have been there. We would have participated. Do not kid yourself otherwise. Jesus says, Father, forgive, release. Some years ago, we had some men come work at our house to sand the floor and re-coat it with polyurethane. If you've been in my house recently, you know it needs it all over again. The last time it was done is the time I'm describing. And the men who came to do that work, and it was done over several days, brought with them a basket full of pigeons. I got my daughter Sarah, who was home at the time, and I said, come and see this, because I knew about people who carried pigeons around in a basket. I knew what they were up to. So Sarah came out of the house in the morning. The man took his basket full of pigeons. He put the basket down on the lawn, lifted the lid, and let them go. And they immediately flew up into the air and were gone. They were returning to their roost, of course. So each day he did this. But there is a sense in which Jesus was saying to the Father, don't carry don't hold to yourself all the sin of these people. Let it go. Release them from it. And inasmuch as you come seeking him to forgive you, and you understand what has just been described, so that you do not have to carry around all that grief and pain, you don't have to carry your basket full of pigeons. Jesus has lifted the lid and let them go and you can walk from here free and clean and forgiven. Inasmuch as that is true for you, so it must be true for those who have sinned against you. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive. Exactly the same word. Aphiemi our trespasses, as we aphiemi those who have trespassed against us. 
in reality, you will never, ever enjoy God's forgiveness until you have lifted the lid and let your pigeons go as well. Let's kneel and pray together. I would ask you to join aloud with me in the Amen at the close of this prayer. Before we pray this formal prayer, take a moment quietly. Again at the foot of the cross. Not being drawn out in pity toward Jesus for what he has done for you. But drawn out in gratitude. Bring all that sin of yours to him as if carrying it in a basket and understand that Jesus on the cross opens that basket and releases you from any obligation and sets you free and the sins are gone and you are forgiven What is it you hold against yourself? What memory is there that scourges your conscience? What is it you have beat yourself up with over the years, unable to forgive yourself or to accept his forgiveness? See Jesus release you. And the Father in heaven set you free. And know that it is gone. And you are forgiven. And with that same breath, all that you have held against others not simply to ask the Father to forgive you, but in that same act of grace, you lift that other basket lid of grief and grievance you have carried against others. Maybe even anger at God. And you forgive as you have been forgiven and let it go. O merciful God, grant me yet again your forgiveness. Forgive and cleanse me from my sins and blot them out of the book of your remembrance. Give me faith so to lay hold of your own holiness and so to rejoice in the righteousness of Christ my Savior that resting on his merits rather than on my own I may more and more become conformed to his likeness my will becoming one with his in obedience to your will All this I ask for his holy name's sake. Amen.